All righty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, everyone. Welcome to day number 28 of Ramadan 360 with a Maghrib Institute. Apologies for the hectic and slightly confusing confusing start time for today's Fatwa night. Jazakum Allah khair for making time to be with us and uh, for being here early and for refreshing that link and for wondering where, uh, you know, talking to everybody else, trying to make sure everything's going fine, wondering where, uh, you know, when we're starting and stuff. Jazakum Allah khair for your enthusiasm, your excitement. Honestly, there was some internal confusion and that we we're on the brink of uh, sending out a message that we we're not going to go ahead with the Fatwa night. And I spoke to Sheikh Walid last minute and I was like, you know what? Um, there's, uh, you know, I'm thinking internally, there's so many beautiful questions. There's so many people who've been waiting for this event. So we pushed through and Jazakum Allah khair for your understanding and apologies for that uh, confusion again. Inshallah, we're going to be having a slightly shorter session, as you can tell, because we do have Ramadan 360 kicking off uh, shortly, inshallah. But we want to make sure that we do have our final fatwa night. Four out of four, alhamdulillah, your questions have been amazing. Your participation, your enthusiasm has been what's kept this community going. So jazakum Allah khair for that. I'm just going to make sure that you guys can start your video so that we can see you guys uh, on screen, alhamdulillah, and start benefiting, inshallah, from Sheikh Walid Basuni, who is, of course, our uh, president of Al-Maghrib Institute. He's our senior scholar. He's the scholar that scholars go to with their questions. And we're very spoiled, alhamdulillah, as a community that we have direct access to a Sheikh. I know a lot of folks in their internal communities or local communities who have a hard time trying to find somebody who can answer questions or, you know, like, mashallah, the people of knowledge are so caught up with so many of their responsibilities that they can, they're not able to, to give that time to the community. But Sheikh Walid, uh, as part of the Maghrib fam, always, always, always gives us time whenever we request it, whether it's on two second notice, whether it's on one week notice, alhamdulillah, may Allah reward and accept. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. With that, you guys, I hope by now know what the setup of the Fatwa Nights is, the way that you ask questions, the way you do everything. Uh, you know, you submit them to the Q&A form. We ask that you don't submit them to the chat because it's hard to keep up with in the chat. Uh, and we want to be fair to those who submitted on time and submitted it earlier in the experience. Um, you still have the opportunity to submit now. We're going to do our best, inshallah, to get through as many questions as we can in the next little bit. Um, but with that, I don't want to take too much more time. Sheikh Walid, I know, is with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. It's a pleasure to have Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us yani, our good deeds um, and um, make us among those who witness Lilith al-Qadr. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, benefit us from all the good deeds that we do. Because good deeds lead to more good deeds. Alhamdulillah. So uh, with this I would say yani, we only have couple of nights, maybe three nights left in Ramadan, make sure that we, we're like a, in a race, you know, when you're in a race and you see the, the, the and the line, the finishing yeah. line, at that moment, you just, you, sprint. you know, yeah. sprint, so you can catch you know, that line on the, in the, among the earlier one. And, um, Allah, it's, it's just a, a beautiful thing that, yes, some people feel sad that Ramadan is over, but I'm happy that I witness it. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. That's a beautiful analogy, Sheikh. There's like 20 things you can say, parallels that you can draw, SubhanAllah. But with that said, um, I think someone will share the, the Q&A form link in the chat in a second. If not, I'll, I'll send it over. But I do want to jump in and actually... Speaking of, I know there today's Q and A. We want to keep on the relevant topics. I know, Sheikh, there was questions about Eid and the final kind of few acts of ibadah they can do in Ramadan. However, I know there's a lot of questions, so I want to start summarizing or maybe just take one for now on the topic of the solar eclipse, which is uh, on everyone's mind and getting a lot of uh, attention nowadays. Um, so somebody's asking. Uh, there's a solar eclipse visible in parts of North America on April 8th. Are there any specific du'as or extra prayers we should be making? And is there any Islamic significance of the event uh, coinciding with Ramadan? Uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Uh, solar eclipse and moon eclipse are among the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind uh, humanity of the power and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, so many people, like Allah said in the Quran about the the, the disbelievers uh, during the time of the previous prophets, every time Allah showed them a sign, they will not be reminded by it. They will not take it as a sign and a reminder. And unfortunately, today you see it, it just became, oh, a phenomenon, a, uh, a cool thing, you know, uh, whatever. 
and nobody think of it as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and lead us to recognize his power, his might, his blessings that he create all this world and universe for us. It's also a, remind, uh, a reminder for us and how insignificant we are comparing to these great, huge uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the sun. You know, the sun is like, can swallow like uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of the size of our earth or tens of thousands of, or thousands of our, the size of our earth. Um, that sun that you see every day. You know, if we just few miles closer, we will be burned. A few miles farther, we'll be like frozen. Um, uh, you know, um, it's just a perfect creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, with this being said, that's the most important thing to be in mind. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, if Allah wished to make the night stays forever, no day time, he would is capable of that. And daylight and no night, no darkness at all. He he could have done that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this life in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a to rotate between day and night, the moon and the sun, to make our life perfect. And uh, with this being said, this is the most important thing to reflect upon, to remind your children of, to remind your family of, to remind yourself of that. And and to uh, that should lead you to submit you to yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, there is no specific dua, there is no specific supplications, but there is a specific prayer that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the eclipse happened, he called people to pray. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray uh, Salat al-Kusuf. Okay. And the uh, eclipse prayer, um, the, the most famous uh, yani, form uh, of it is that you pray two rak'ah, uh, and in these two rak'ah, each rak'ah has two ruku'ah, has two ruku'ah. And um, uh, in, in you basically, you make takbir and you make ruku'ah, okay? Then uh, you go, subhanahu rabbi al -Azim. then you stand up, then you start reading again, okay? Then after that, uh, you basically, uh, when you stand up, you read Al-Fatiha, then you read uh, Salah. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he prayed, he would say, Allahu Akbar, then he read Al-Fatiha, then he read whatever from the Quran, and he read long recitation. Then he made Rukur, which is long as well. Then he rise from the Rukur, Sami'a Allah Alaihi Hamidah. Then he would read Al-Fatiha, and he would read long recitation, but shorter than the first rakah. Then he go to sujood. Then he go to another sujood. Then he will, Allahu Akbar, stand up from the sujood. Okay? And he will read long recitation. Then he said, Allahu Akbar, or go to rukur. Sami Allah liman hamida. Then he read al-Fatiha and read another surah or salon, but shorter than the third and the, and the second and the first. Then he will make rukur. Subhanahu Rabbi Razim. Then he will stand up then he go to sujood between the two sajda. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reported that he will make the uh, the salah in it, each part of the salah is a little bit longer than usual. The sitting between the two sujood, the sujood itself, the tashahud, and occupied that with uh, with Allah, with Rukur. Um, uh, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed uh, the uh, kusuf and this uh, incident of praying al kusuf and calling people to prayer reported by Bukhari and Muslim and Hadith Abu Musa radiallahu uh, anhu and Ibn uh, Saud al-Ansari and others. Um, so this is the way Salat al kusuf is. Um, and Aisha radiallahu anha, she's the one who gave us the detailed description of how the rukur is. So, uh, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed two raka, uh, basically, uh, with four rukur, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and four sujood, which is a very different. Uh, some of the madahib, they might have a different way 
of making uh, Salat al Kusu. Uh, in Islam, we believe it is prayed the regular uh, Salat. It's exactly the same with one Ruku only. In any case, the second Ruku is Sunnah. Uh, the first Ruku is Wajib. So even if you do one Ruku, it is sufficient, inshallah ta'ala. But in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have given uh, have given uh, yani, uh, khutbah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, giving khutbah uh, in that uh, incident a reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is sunnah also to give uh, a khutbah to give a khutbah uh, to people. Um, um, and I'm just trying to think what else can be um, Salat al-Kusuf uh, Salat al-Kusuf uh, also ordained uh, for people in the masjid or at home uh, like sisters at home if she doesn't go to the masjid because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهَا فَقُومُوا فَصَلُّوا When you see the eclipse, you pray. So yes, Shaykh uh, Nadimir rahimahullah was asked about, what about women, can they pray salat al at home? He said, yes, they can pray at home. Uh, and they can go to the masjid and pray, because also in the, during the process of time, women came to the masjid and prayed for sure. But it's sooner for men to pray it at the masjid with the uh, people. Can they make jama'ah at their own home? Like the sister lead other group? Allah alam, if she, uh, yes, uh, women can lead women in Salat al Salat al Nafila or Salat al Farida. That's fine, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so these are some of the things that I would like to. Um, I yani need to mention, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make this uh, yani incident a reminder of us and make us among Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will not punish because of the action of the ignorant among us. Allahumma okay. uh, um, The next question, we'll try to wrap it Just, five. Just, just yes. one more thing. Salat uh, al-Kusuf is sunnah, it's not wajib. Just in case uh, somebody would ask. That's okay. the majority of the scholars, rahimahumullah ta'ala. It is uh, it is sunnah. It is highly uh, recommended. Um, and as I said, there is a khutbah. And even Shafi, rahimahullah, I, I believe, he said that uh, it's like khutbah to Jum'ah. You sit between the two khutbah. Uh, yani, uh, the same format of khutbah to Jum'ah. Uh, but the hadith, Wallahu alam, looked like um, it was only one khutbah no sitting in the middle. Uh, and that's what the Hanabil said. That's what the hadith actually uh, said. Uh, I think the Ahnaf and uh, famous opinion from the Hanabil that the khutbah is not attach, attached to the sunnah of salah. It's not part of the salah attached to salah in any form or shape. It just happened that the person gave advice that day. Uh, but the other narration, the Hanabil, I know it is sunnah to combine the khutbah with the salah uh, and as well as the malikiyah. It is recommended for a person to give an advice uh, to people. And uh, it, when you pray, uh, as long as it's visible, but if it's not visible to you, I don't think it is ordained for you to pray Salat al Kusuf. Let's say you live somewhere where it's not going to be visible for you. You heard about it happening somewhere else. It's not It's not to you to do Salat al Kusuf. Yeah, how would you or know where it is? Or, yeah, or only when you put the sun, the, 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 the glasses on. That's when you see it. I don't believe that this is also a uh, reason for you to pray Salat al Kusuf. Only if it's visible, like I and the Jamia. The one, if you see it through the glasses, I, I, I'm not, yani, um, I wouldn't say no if you want to pray. This is an issue, need ishtihad, and, and I put this forward for the 
the, the fatwa committee to look into it. Like Amjad or something from North, North America. Okay. So I How do you know it's finished? You do your best. Like now by calculation, they tell you when it's going to finish. You do your estimate. If you finish the salah and it's still the eclipse, engage in dhikr and dua. Okay, okay. Sounds good. The next question is, um, if you save up money for hajj, do you have to pay zakah on that money? Pay zakah. Yes, yes. Um, Unless you go ahead and you pay the agency right now. No. So there's no zakah. Fair enough. Uh, the next also on zakah, uh, but zakat al-fitr is, is it better to give our zakat al-fitr at our local masjid, which gives to people overseas, or to give at a masjid on an hour away, which gives to the local community? Local community. So it doesn't matter it is an hour away or the one next to you. Whoever you think they will uh, treat your zakat footer with uh, care and they will deliver it to the people who deserve it. Perfect. Uh, the next question is, is it mandatory to read Quran in its order? Or can we switch reading between different surahs or juz after completing one? For example, if I'm reading one uh, juz and I switch to the 15th or something or something else, is it permissible to do this? As you might know, the order of the surah in the Quran is not from the Prophet, it's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a Sahaba radiallahu anhu. That's why the Masahab, the Sahaba have a different order. But this is the order that they agreed upon finally, uh, and it became something we have to keep and must keep because that's how the Sahab, the Ijma, come to it. So, this, if you understand that, so the order. There's, there's no obligation to follow that order in particular. So you can read whatever you want in, in each order. The only thing, you cannot make a disorder to the verses. One verse from Fatiha, one verse from Qul Wahad, one verse from Al-Baqarah, one verse from al Imran. That's not a lot. But the order of the surah or passages of surahs, you can switch from one rakah to another, to other uh, passages. Or if you finish the surah and you read another surah, even if it's before it, in the same rakat, so it's allowed. There is no the proof that it is not allowed. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read in the same rakat. He read al-Baqarah, then al-Nisa, then al-Imran, in this order. So this is our, not the same order we have in the Muslim. Yeah. Um, the next question I have is, um, if we have the if we have are menstruating during the last 10 days, do we have the same reward if we have the intention to pray? Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the intention of anything that you have, the, the, the intention for it, if you couldn't do it for a valid reason, like menses. But make sure that you invest your time also. Another thing, Aisha, when she said, Allah, what I do? Because in, uh, I'm, I'm always, I love this hadith. He didn't say pray, uh, he didn't say maqiyam al-layl. He said, say, if you witness Rayat al-Qadr, what should I say? He said, say. Uh, this dua, Ya Allah, you love Afu, which is forgiveness. So forgive me. You need to engage in dua. Nabi Sassam said, if you say, La ilaha illallah, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, Allahu akbar wa lillahi alhamd, Allah forgive your sin. You can do that while you are having your mind. Reading the Quran, listening to the Quran, learning the knowledge, providing service for people. Yes. Right. The next question is, um, a person misses fasting Ramadan for two years due to a long-term illness for which recovery prospects were unknown by medical professionals. He pays the fidya for these missed fasts. He subsequently recovers the next year and is able to fast. Does he need to make up the 60 fasts he already paid fidya for? No, alhamdulillah, he already, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him a long health, long healthy life with iman. Uh, so, no, khalas, you just start fasting. Perfect. Um, the next question is, I have a tax-free investment account. Do I have to pay zakah on the market value increased from the baseline of funds put in? Um, or the money increase is, sorry, the money increase is in stock shares, not in my bank account, and it fluctuates up and down. You choose a day for your zakat, and in that day, you see the value of that these stocks. How much are they, and that's what you give zakat on. The day of the zakat, how much they were worth in the market if you sell them. So you give zakat on that. Um, the next question is, is it, it is recommended to pray Isha and Fajr in congregation as the reward is as if one prayed the entire night. 
Some parts of the world, women aren't allowed to pray in the masjid. Are we still able to re achieve this benefit in another way? Some parts of the world, women are or are not. Are not. Are not allowed to. That's wrong. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do not prevent women from coming to the masjid. So whoever doing that is, is in a clear error on haram. And it's not allowed for them to do that. I'm worried that it will be sinful for each woman want to go to pray and they refuse. And the woman there should demand and should ask for the right to have a place to pray in, in, the, in the back of the masjid like the Prophet Sallallahu masjid was. And if there is nobody listening to her, she can't do that, she will not be listened to. Allah SWT will give her the ajr. But she should know the ajr of praying at home is more than praying at the masjid. So she's not missing anything. But she, she's just missing her rights. That's her right. Yes. The next question is, um, do I deduct my dues like mortgage and utility bills and employee salary from my total zakatable amount? Is there a limit to how many months of payments can be deducted? If so? Only the month of the zakat. That's it. Like the mortgage this month. Okay, let's say you give zakat and... Um, 10th of April and 10th of April happened to be 2nd or sorry, the 10th of Ramadan and the 10th of Ramadan happened to be 2nd of March and the 2nd and 3rd of March that's where I give my mortgage uh, payment. How else you take that mortgage out? But not the April and May and the rest of the year. Yeah. Okay, and the payment of your car, any kind of Payment of dues. Yeah, when it comes to taxes, it's kind of tricky because taxes over the whole entire year, and you did not have the year yet. You mm -hmm. kind of estimate the amount of taxes related to the months that you have already in the year. So, for example, if you tax twelve thousand dollars, or based on the income, so that means three months. I deduct the tax. Three months cost monthly, for example, three thousand dollars. So I I take three thousand dollars as a debt. Have to be paid to IRS. This is due on me. Um, the next question is It is said that Umrah during Ramadan is the equivalent of completing Hajj. If this is the case, does the obligation of Hajj get fulfilled if one completes Umrah during Ramadan? And if one can complete Umrah, um, but it's not sure when they can fi financially afford Hajj or even if they will get a spot, what should they do? So if, you, we need to learn a, a rule. Uh, anything that it has a virtue, it doesn't replace the actual one. Like, for example, when the Prophet ﷺ said, praying in the masjid, okay, equal to 20, uh, double, 23 double. It doesn't mean, khalas, I take uh, 23 salah off. You know, I have vacation for the next 23 salah. Or I won't go to Mecca and it's 100,000 salah. So, you know what, for the next 400 years, I don't need to pray because I already got 400 salah. It doesn't work this way. Or I miss Salah before, so I go and I do this. Khalas, I don't need to make them up because they're already 100,000 Salah or 500 Salah. That's not how it works. Each man or not. So, but what it does, it's a reward. For. So, even if this hadith, we agree that Umrah Ramadan equal to Hajj with the Prophet, it means a reward, but it does not take the obligation away. And uh, some ulama said that this hadith was only related to the woman who asked the Prophet about her missing doing hajj with him. Then he said to her, if you do umrah, it will be like in Ramadan, it will be like the ajr of hajj with me. It's not to replace it, but to make her feel good. Because making hajj with the Prophet is different than making hajj without the Prophet. No doubt. So he, he want to tell her now, I think she will get, inshallah, some more reward. Um, some ulama said that was said to her only, but I don't believe that. I believe that Umrah Ramadan is highly rewarded. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, the next question is sorry about that. Um, to make up fast, can we fast on white days and therefore both are actioned? Yes, white days, Monday, Thursday, you know, yeah, black days, orange days, whatever days you want. I know the white days means. 13, 14, 15. Okay, you can do that. But what's not allowed 
to do is to count Arafah, for example, as one of the makeup days, or the six days of Shawwal, or 10th of Muharram, because they are specific ones. You have to have the intention for them specific. The other one are general. Any three days in the any in, in any month, you can combine the two intentions. But not in Arafah, not in Muharram, 10th of Muharram, not the six days of Shawwal. These are cannot. Um, the next question is during Eid, some people finally Eid questions. <laughs> during Eid, some people pray over food after Eid Salah. Is this permissible? Seems to be a common thing in Pakistani cultures. Over what? Over the food after Eid. I, first of all, I'm a Pakistani. I don't know. I've never heard of that. <laughs> but what's over the food means? Say that. Okay. Say the question again. It says during Eid, some people pray over food after Eid Salah. Oh yeah, they make dua maybe. Uh... Yeah, I don't know what does what that means, but maybe making dua before uh -huh. they eat, or gather around food and make dua collectively. Making dua before you eat is okay. Okay. Pray over the food. Maybe they pray janaza over the food because they're gonna kill the food. I'm not sure. <laughs> so that's the case. A lot of mercy in that food. <laughs> Afifa says no. They pray and they blow over the food. <clears throat> and uh, they play over the. I don't know. To make dry, I don't know. You make ruqya for the food because they're gonna be destroyed. I don't know. Uh, but the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, he said, "Don't blow into the food." Okay, sounds good. Um, exactly for that clarification. The next question is: Can you make dua in salah um, when the ayat of Hellfire and Paradise are recited? And what dua do you recite when one is performing the sujood of recitation in salah? Uh, the dua for sujood and recitation is the same as any sujood, subhanahu wa rabbi ala. And you can make whatever dua you want. As for um, when a, a verse of hellfire or paradise or a verse speaking about making tasbih or saying alhamdulillah or saying subhanallah or say sallallahu ala muhammad, something of that nature, or mentioning Allah's mercy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment and anger in, in regard to these specific the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi used to pause and he would say, uh, Oh Allah, I ask you for your mercy. Oh Allah, I ask you for Jannah. Oh Allah, protect me. Oh Allah, I, I seek your refuge with you. You know, uh, with your face from such and such. And then SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, whenever there is a verse asking you to make tasbih. And uh, this uh, issue have a different opinion among the scholars. The majority said it is sunnah to do it during uh, volunteer prayer and qiyam al night prayer. And I noticed this is missing sunnah, uh, salat al utr and night prayer. Um, some ulama said, no, it also applied to the obligatory prayer, the wajib, the faridah prayer. Uh, but, uh, and also many of the scholars said that, Hanbari said, no, you don't do that. Uh, because the Nabi Sallallahu only reported that he did this in volunteer prayers. And if he would have done it in obligatory prayer, it would have been reported. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi prayed so many times out loud, and it never reported that he did such thing. Only reported when he prayed his night prayer. Some said only in the night prayer, not in any other volunteer prayer. Um, anyway, in any case, um, um, I do believe that you can do it in any prayer, volunteer or non-volunteer, um, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a salah is dhikrullah, and this is part of dhikr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and there is no proof to uh, differentiate between volunteer and non-volunteer unless there is a clear evidence for that. The issue is not, yani, alhamdulillah, if you want to avoid it during the obligatory prayer, it's fine, it's fine. But in the, in the, and, and what to say? Anything. There's no specific wording. Wallah, oh alhamdulillah, is, is, if it's a verse of, uh, about hamd uh, or to speak, say subhanallah. If it's about hellfire, say a'udhu billah. Allahumma najjina min al-nar. Anything of that nature. Allah protect us from hellfire and so forth. And you can say it in English and Arabic. If, if you don't know how to say it in Arabic. Yes. Right. Um, the next question is also on, on Eid is, in general, for women, there is no place at the masjid. How to perform the Eid Salah at home and at what time? No, Eid has to be praying the Musallah. Uh, 
You cannot go to the masjid to pray. خلاص, no eat for you. You can pray two rak'ah. Just a regular two rak'ah as a form of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa told the men who miss eight prayer to pray two rak'ah. Um, but unfortunately, this is also very wrong because in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa not only he will bring women to eat, to pray, he will ask the women who do not pray, those who are figure period, to come to the eight prayer, to witness the salah and to give the, it's a happiness, it's a, you know, to make, to witness the dua and it's just very unfortunate. The next yes. question is, um, when it's said, when it's said to do charity the last 10 nights, if I give my zikah under the zikah terms during the blessed night, can I expect the same reward? Inshallah. Inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt, good deeds done in, in a virtual time. It's, it's a reason for your the reward to be multiplied. The next question is, when I pray at home, I don't get the same ease and light feeling when, as when I pray in the masjid. It feels more difficult when I pray at home. Why is that? Because in congregation, there is, you know, um, something psychologically, when you have many people doing the same thing into it, it has more impact. Also, more malaika, there is more angel in the masjid. Also, the recitation of the imam and the leading of the prayer, and it might he might read better than you. He might be reading uh, new verses that you're not used to. It you know, this whole environment has no doubt. That's why Salat al Jama'ah is such a beautiful thing. So, Sheikh, I got a lengthy question that's similar to one of the previous ones that was asked. It was on the the blowing over food after Eid Salah. Um, but just with some context. So someone is saying that they found it common in the Asian culture um, and the subcontinent for people who belong to the Hanafi school of thought to prepare food for after the Eid Salah and pray over it for dead, for like dead people, for like a gift of some sort with, you know, for someone who's passed along. And it's also the same for Thursdays, which is are, which are called Jumrat, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this happens every week before Maghrib uh, prayer. So they, the older generation says this is correct and it's something that they've always done. However, they can't find an Islamic ruling on this anywhere. And they're wondering where it's coming from and if there's any authentic kind of source of that. And if it's within the fold of Islam. They will not find. This is bid'ah. Uh, I mean, if the people believe it's sunnah and it is from the deen, it is bid'ah. It's not from the deen of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But can you make food and you distribute it on behalf of the dead people as a form of sadaqah on their behalf? Yes, you can. Does it must be in the Eid, like in some even Arab culture, they do that. They give an Eid, an Eid. They go to the cemetery and they visit the dead and they distribute food. And I think that's one of the uh, bad practices and, and culture, in my opinion. And there is no any virtue or any righteousness in it. Why? Because you're supposed to be celebrating Eid with the living one, not with the dead. The dead, they're celebrating their Eid with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the angels, with the brothers, sisters, Muslims. Almost with, their, with, their, with the people who passed away. Not with you. It is sad that the day that meant to be the day of happiness, you bring this sad memory to you. There's no doubt any going to the graveyard and going to the... And you don't go to the graveyard to have, mashallah, like happy and to be, you know, uh, no. You, you go to the graveyard to break that arrogant in you, that hope in the dunya and life and, and bring the akhirah and to be like, that's why you don't go too many times. Sometimes, from one time to another, to keep you, to keep, to don't lose that feeling. But you can't live like that. So it is a bad pack practice, a bad culture, a bad habit to go to visit the dead and the, and the Eid. And it's not from the sin of the Prophet at all. So, yeah. so uh, that's one. Two, the issue of food, you can distribute it in the behalf, that's fine. If Eid, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You know, but to think it is sunnah or it is something that should be done or you treat it like sunnah. Oh, if you don't do it, there's something wrong or I'm missing something. That's not, uh, that's speaking bid'ah. And also blowing over the food. No, you should not blow over the food. You don't give ruqya to the food. That's bid'ah and that's nonsense. Okay. And 
you're going to, I hope you don't blow over the food and you give it to people because you can make them sick. Uh, it is just not not even a sanitizing thing. Um, yes. Jazakallah Sheikh, for that uh, practical specification. Um, with that, we are wrapping up, inshallah, for our final fatwa if, night for if, Ramadan. If you allow me, uh, Hafsa, I want to comment on... one minute, Sheikh, because we okay. have to start another session, okay. inshallah. But we Something love similar to what we talked about earlier. Yes. Uh, I have seen people on social media. I have some even seen community make some statements. It, it, it's, it was very disappointing for me to see that and to hear these kind of comments, which is this say, uh, we should not celebrate Eid as a form of solidarity with people of Gaza. You know what? I want the people of Gaza to celebrate Eid. I want the kids in Gaza to wear whatever they have, whatever toy they have, whatever... Uh, yeah, maybe they don't have any. If they make anything out of the rubbles just to make it like uh, they show their happiness, even in this difficult moment. And I think our kids, our kids, that who, alhamdulillah, have been exposed to what's happening in Gaza and seeing all these things happening every day, to tell them there is no eat for them. What do you think the outcome will be? No eat celebrations. And people said, "Oh, the money that you're gonna spend." You know, and, and making a each celebration carnival or like, you know, a fun day for them. Take that money and donate it to Gaza. And I hate this kind of mentality. Yani, why you have to put me in the two choices? Donate to Gaza or to do a each celebration. Yeah, I'll donate to Gaza too. When I will do each celebration. That means, you know what? You don't eat, you don't drink, you don't wear clothes, you don't do anything. And everything, money should go to Gaza. Don't make iftar, don't make madri'ish for the community. Let's save this money and put it all. No, that's not how life is. And Nabi Sallallahu celebrated Eid and uh, things happen while there is calamity in the Muslim world. I'm not sure what, what, what is going on here and how this has became something that even need to explain. I thought this will be a common sense, but sometimes common sense are not common. You know? Celebrating the Eid does not mean I forgot about my brothers. Having a good time with my family, it means it doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I'm not care about my brother and sisters. Khanas, that means you don't intimate with your, your wife, you don't play with your kids, you don't do... You, what is this? It's not how life is. That's not gonna... That's not gonna... Uh, uh, give strength to your brother and sisters in Gaza, the only thing it will do, it will empty your days from its own strength. It make you weak. Make you unable, unsustainable. It make you unreasonable. It make this case people will not even be excited about it. They will give up. So just, you know, I think it, it has the complete opposite impact. I just want to end with that. And, and Jazakumullah khair. That was really essential. I think a lot of the community is struggling to figure out what, you know, what's appropriate, what's, what's, what's selfish for us to be doing. And I know that there's a lot of misinformation or guidance coming out there. So this is why we need Sheikh like you to give us time and to correct us with humor and with anecdotes and uh, in your specific style. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we really enjoyed benefiting from you, from you Sheikh. And shall we look forward to continuing uh, in the months post Ramadan. May Allah bless you and your family and accept from you. Amin Rabbil Alameen. We'll see you very soon. And, and, and make sure that you guys don't forget your brothers and sisters and Gaza and your dua. And not only Gaza, there's a lot of people suffering in Syria and Burma and Kashmir, you know, in India and in and, and many places, the war in Sudan and Yemen, they just the, the, the wounds are too many. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. A great thank job, Hafsa, as usual. And everybody in this call, thank you very, very much. And hopefully, inshallah, I'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. Eid Mubarak, Eid Mubarak to all of you. I hope to see you guys in your city when I come visit you or in your apartment sector. And don't forget to support Al Maghrib. <laughs> that was Sheikh Walid for our final Fatwa night for Ramadan 360. I'm so glad we went ahead with that. Alhamdulillah, the vibes are always amazing. And yes, Dimo, you, you got it right. Alhamdulillah. No, Janine, you are not late. We just had our final Fatwa night, which happens the, uh, you know right before the Ramadan 360 sessions on Sundays. And we are kicking off now day number 28 of Ramadan 360, our third last day, not that anyone's counting, alhamdulillah. Uh, and it's a blessing, of course, to be back with you all uh, for these final few nights. 
Today is a special day, of course, uh, not because not only because we have our blessed Sheikh Majid Mahmoud back with us for his final session for Ramadan 360. He's going to be covering the topic of self-accountability. We're also going to hear a, a beneficial reminder for our amazing friends at HHRD. It's our final uh, helping hands for Relief and Development Day at Ramadan 360. Uh, and inshallah, we look forward to benefiting from them and continue to support as we have been as a community. You guys have been incredible this year. I feel like I'm impressed every year, but this year is something, something different. Uh, we are, we're gonna postpone the Kahoot till tomorrow, just so that we have the opportunity to have as many people benefiting inshallah from that. And yes, Ramadan went by so fast. I feel like it was just yesterday I was saying, welcome to day one of Ramadan 360. And here we are, subhanAllah. Uh, but there's still so much to benefit from. You know how you hear those reminders a lot that actions are by their ending and being consistent and especially during these ble blessed final days and nights uh, that we have the opportunity to benefit from each other and encourage and motivate each other and benefit from our instructors as well. Now, of course, you've seen Sheikh Majid a couple times uh, this Ramadan already, alhamdulillah. Uh, for those who don't know, mashallah, Sheikh Majid is a specialist in Tazkiya and Adab. He was one of those famous uh, Amagrib graduates who became instructors, alhamdulillah. He has that on his resume and, and mashallah, he started that, 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 that trend for many others to follow in his footsteps. Uh, he's taught many famous classes with Amagrib Institute. Um, I'm remembering his famous uh, Art of Manner seminar. And then now, mashallah, he's been touring many others, Devotion, Out of the Darkness, Parish Nations, and just recently, the Kings of Jerusalem, which is, of course, very timely considering all the focus on the Blessed Lands right now, alhamdulillah. And we're very excited to have him back with us to teach this final session on self-accountability. Um, please, as, as always, support generously HHRD. Right now, we're going to be focusing on their uh, orphan sponsorship, something that, subhanAllah, is very close to our hearts as Muslims as well. And that's a huge need for, especially with the rising costs of, of, of uh, inflation and feud insecurity throughout the world. Inshallah, we'll drop that link here in the chat, hhrd.org floor slash Ramadan 360. But with that, let's jump into our 28th session. I hope you guys are ready. Bismillah. Sheikh Majid, Sheikh Majid assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing this fine Sunday? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah I'm doing very good. Jazakallah khair, Sister Hafsa. And thank you all for calling in and uh, tuning live to this session. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feek, Sheikh. I don't want to take any more of your time. I know we're really looking forward to benefiting from you, Sheikh. So inshallah, we'll jump into the session and then we'll have some opportunity for a reminder and questions at the end. Bismillah. Inshallah. Hafsa, I have a quick question if you don't mind me asking. Yes. Uh, is the camera looking a little bit off my camera, it's like a, quality? It's a little grainy. Grainy. So... Okay, uh, and let me try my phone really quick. All right, bismillah, bismillah. Inshallah, we'll give that a go. Recording so that in progress. Okay, we can't hear you right is now. It, is this better? Now it's better, alhamdulillah. Much better? Okay, so I'll the use The audio this. is better. The phone I'm going to spotlight, I'm going to swipe this out. We have triple Sheikh Mad or double <laughs> Sheikh Mad <Majid> on screen. <laughs> there we go. We've got you, alhamdulillah. So, so, so the phone, camera, and audio are better than the previous one? They are. Can you switch it to landscape by any chance, Sheikh? To see, I don't know if it'll automatic. Okay, there, there you go. We see more of you now, Sheikh. All right, this is better. All righty, there we go. Bismillah, much. If we can set up the phone a little bit higher, there we go. So we can see all of you. Is that better? It is. Alhamdulillah. Okay. All right. Sheikh. Forgive me, guys, if I'm looking down upon you. I'm not looking down. That's how the camera is. Okay, Bismillah. All right. Bismillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. We begin by mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and we ask Allah to send his peace and his blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khairan for uh, being here once again live and those that may be watching the recorded session. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you and I to end Ramadan strong. Ya Rabbil Alameen. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, may Allah make the last two days of Ramadan better than all the days that passed. Ya Rabb. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, You know, actions are judged not just by intentions, which is a hadith that almost every one of us know. Actions are judged by intentions. But there's another hadith. Actions are judged based on how they end. <coughs> to me, Allah allow us to be able to end Ramadan in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, self-accountability. I asked uh, my daughter, what do you know about self-accountability? She said, is, does this have something to do with your bank account? I said, no, Bob. <laughs> right? The word account, accountability. So, naam, self-accountability. Now, as you're maybe listening, watching, driving, what would you rate your Ramadan out of 10? Just think about it. You want to type it, you can type it. You want to think of it for a few seconds. 
what would you give yourself out of 10? 10 meaning like the best. Okay, alhamdulillah. All right. Okay, excellent. All right. Now the second question. Ready for the second question? What is 10? Right? What is 10? Because now you grade yourself or you rate yourself. But what's your point of reference? Maybe you're rated 9. But when you know what's a 10, you're a 3. And maybe if you rated yourself 5, when you know what's 10, you're 9. So who tells us what's a 10? Is it subjective? Um, in a way, <coughs> but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a 10. All right, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a 10. So we try to compare our Ramadan to his. We try to see what have we done throughout these blessed nights. How is our situation with our fasting? How is our situation with our salah? And, and what makes a 10 and a 9 and an 8? You start with the obligations. So did we do all our salawat? Did we fast all the days assuming we were capable and not traveling? Did we uh, pay zakat al-fitr? That's a 10. You're like, what's zakat al-fitr? Uh, you're a 9 then. You're not a 10. Zakat al-fitr is a charity that you give, which in my area, people say, or the scholars, they say between 12 to $15. Every single one in the family should have that amount paid. So did we do that? Is that planned, inshallah? Honestly, I'll be very frank with you. I forgot about it until I prayed in the masjid just a couple of days ago. And then the imam, after the salah, he said, uh, brothers and sisters, please remember to pay zakat al-fitr. So in generally speaking, <coughs> we have to see how things with the Prophet Sallallahu was. One more thing. If what we did in Ramadan is very similar to before Ramadan, then that's not really good. If it was more, then that's really good, inshallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did they say about his generosity? They said, he is the most generous person on earth. Like no one can compete with the generosity. And obviously we're not talking numbers as much as the quality of the charity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said one dollar donation or one dirham donation can be heavier than 100,000. And how is that even possible? How can one dirham on the scale on the day of judgment, one dollar donation is heavier to Allah than a than 100,000? How is that? So the Sahaba, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu said, the one who gave one dirham, one dollar, he only had two, Allahu Akbar. So he gave 50% of his wealth. And the one who gave 100,000, he has so much money. So 100,000 was pocket change to him. So to Allah, the donations are not the same. The one dollar is better than 100,000. In dunya, to you and I, no. The 100,000 is definitely a lot nicer, right? You have a customized letter that comes to your house. Uh, we call you and we thank you and you get a nice tax receipt. But to Allah, the one dollar is far better and heavier than a hundred thousand. Okay, so we mentioned that about the Prophet Sallallahu Now, what did they say about his charity in Ramadan? His charity in Ramadan goes to another level that he's not even like it outside Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. So hopefully you and I, inshallah, we were able to go up a notch with their Quran recitation, with their dua, with their charity, with their adhkar, with their attending halaqat, just going to the ne next level, of, even just a little bit. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I pray this dua, may Allah make the last two days of Ramadan the best two days. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Now here, <coughs> when it comes once again to self-accountability, look what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said. Umar said, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourself accountable before you are held accountable. And calculate and try to imagine how heavy is your scale before the scale really comes and it weighs your deeds. So he's telling us, be two steps ahead. Think about it. I remember, subhanAllah, when uh, now tax season is coming, right? Right uh, for all of us. Uh, when is tax season? It's right now. I remember, this is the first time ever, I did my taxes in December 2023. 
usually taxes are in April 2024. Okay, why did I do that? Because I want to see in December how much am I going to pay the government or how much is the government going to pay me back? I want to get the, the numbers before the day comes where I have to pay. So now when I know, for example, that I got to pay the government a lot, I can tell myself now it's a time to buy a new laptop before the end of the year. Why? So I can put it in my taxes. Subhanallah. But if I now did my taxes after December 2023, then what happens? Then I will basically say, oh, I wish I bought a laptop so I can put it as expenses and deduct it and so on and so forth. Subhanallah. So this is what we do in worldly matters, in our taxes, in our job interviews, we read about the company, then much better is to do that with Akhirah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he beautifully says, he says, whoever wronged his brother or sister, فَلْيَتَحَلَّلْهُ مِنْهُ الْيَوْمِ If there's any guy, if there's any girl, if there's any young man, young woman, Muslim or Kafir, that you have wronged, that you have oppressed, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, today, today, clear it up. اليوم, he said, اليوم, مش بكرة, not tomorrow, not as soon as possible, now, now, اليوم. Why, why Ya Rasulullah? He said, be, <coughs> Alhamdulillah. He said, before a day comes where no money will be used or can be applied to benefit you. So, Yom Al Qiyamah, Let's say, for example, may Allah protect us, someone stole, uh, yeah. let's say someone stole someone's money. So the Prophet is telling you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, return the money that you stole today. Why is that? Because Yom Al-Qiyamah, when you see, oh, you're going to get punished for stealing someone's money, what happens? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you cannot pay them back on their judgment. So fix it now before it is too late. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a very famous, powerful hadith, scary but hopeful inshallah he asks the people do you do you know who's the bankrupt so they said the bankrupt is the one that has no money no assets so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says the bankrupt is the one who comes on the day of judgment with so many good deeds <coughs> subhanallah so many good deeds fasting charity salah allahu akbar in the community that person was like the elite, we all we would say, we I wish I wish I'm like that brother. Subhanallah. However, brothers and sisters, let me actually put this mute here. However, the Prophet Sallallahu says, This man came and he cursed so and so. This man came and he hurt so and so. This man came and he oppressed and he even killed and he did this and did that. So what happens in Al-Qiyamah? The one who stole, can they now pay back the money? It's too late. Can the one who injured someone, can they cure the injury and pay blood money? Nope, it's too late. Can the one who backbit now Yom Al-Qiyamah speak good about them to make up for it? No, it's too late. So what's the only thing that is possible? An exchange of hasanat and sayyat. That's the only currency available. So the one who had all these good deeds, what happens? The one who they wronged, you start passing good deeds. Okay, khalas. I know I made fun of you in high school. I'm sorry. Okay. Take a thousand five hundred hasanat. Alhamdulillah. Done. Then after some time, someone shows up. Hey, you made fun of me or you spoke about me in college. Okay, here you go. He gave him all these hasanat. He keeps going back and forth, back and forth. And he imagine, subhanAllah, imagine 20,000 people show up. You're like, I did not back by 20,000 people. There's no way. They said, no, there is a way. How is that? How can someone back by 20,000 or 50,000? If they, let's say, mocked or backbit an entire village, right? People from that area are stingy. They are not intelligent. SubhanAllah. Imagine the entire city comes to Yom Al-Qiyamah. May Allah protect us, right? And Allah is the ultimate and the wise judge. So then the person gives all these hasanat. So eventually someone comes. Like, oh, this guy again. What do you want? I need some of your good deeds. Then the person says, I no longer have good deeds. The one who has mountains, mountains, now has everything emptied. So they said, if you cannot give me your good deeds, then I will pass on to you my bad deeds. Allahu Akbar. And he passed it on to him, brothers and sisters. Then that person is pushed into the hellfire after he started as like the highest of levels, inshallah, going to Jannah. Now he went to the depth of hell May Allah protect us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. 
So that's why the accountability part, you wronged someone, today you fix it. Today, you spoke ill about someone, make dua for them. Try to speak good about them in that same gathering. Make extra, extra, extra dua. May Allah forgive us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gives us a beautiful story, brothers and sisters. And if this man was able to have some sense of accountability, if this man said to himself, let me see what I can do. And when he looked at his situation, he did not give up. Then you and I should be inspired by the following man. Are you ready, inshallah? Bismillah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there was a person from the past who killed 99 people. And I know many of you perhaps know this hadith, but I want you to look at it from that lens. He killed 99 people. And then what happened? This man looked at his life, looked at his situation, and he realizes he's in trouble. But he did not give up. Allahu Akbar. So he did the assessment. He did the accountability. And now he felt regretful and he wants to do something about it. So he was asking around, tell me someone who is the biggest scholar on earth. So I have a question. Why did he ask for the biggest scholar on earth? Why, why, why do you think that? Because his sin was one of the biggest that can ever be done on earth. Subhanallah. He felt, I need, I need the alim to tell him my situation. And Jazallah khair, Sheikh Walid, mashallah. Um, you know how Sheikh Walid, for those that attended earlier, the fatwa session, how he mentioned about celebrating Eid. And I remember a lot of uh, respected, beloved imams, uh, they said, let's not celebrate Eid. In terms of uh, fest fest festivals like every year. And I remember, I'm in, I'm, I'm in that group, and I remember when they issued the statement, subhanAllah, my heart was not comfortable. Subhanallah, I was not comfortable. I even asked one other brother, I'm like, really cancel everything? Subhanallah. And then you have Shaykh Walid Basuni, khair. he kind of affirms that this is not really uh, the way to go. Subhanallah. So it's very important. And may Allah bless all our Imams. It's very important when you have a question, especially a sensitive question, to go to the people of knowledge. But may Allah bless Shaykh Walid and the whole team. Ya Rabbil Alameen. So then, this man said, give me the, tell me who is the biggest scholar. I have, my, I have a question. So they said, go to this place. Go to that person. This person will help you out. Now, they did not take him to a alim, a scholar. They took him to a rahib, a abid, a high level worshiper. Let me explain. Do you have someone in your local masjid who's always there first row? Always there. Maybe has a beard. May Allah bless him. We love him for the sake of Allah. Wonderful guy. Right? So the people... Because they see this man always in the masjid, always praying, has a long beard, first row, always reading the Quran. So right away, they put him at the alim level. Subhanallah. And that's a mistake many of us do. May Allah forgive us. So then he went to him and he thought he was a scholar. So he said, Sheikh, I killed 99 people. Allahu Akbar. 99 bodies in his record. Is there any way for Allah to accept my return? Is there any way I can start a new page? So what does the man say? He says, Tis'an wa tis'ina nafsa. After you killed 99 people, you think you have a chance. You looked at your life and you're like, you know what, maybe there's room for me to rectify my situation. Then he said, la, no way, no way. I killed 99 people. There's no way you'll see mercy or love, forgiveness or anything. So what happened? That man, well, if that's the case and I cannot be forgiven and it's a hopeful situation and I cannot clear my account with Allah, he pulled his sword and he killed him. Yes, he killed the Abid. So now he has 100 bodies under his record, subhanAllah. Now, as I'm saying this story, I really hope, inshallah, none of us will be very busy thinking, how would it be fair for this man to be forgiven when he killed 100 people? Let Allah deal with it. Allah ar rahim Allah, Al-Hakim, the All-Wise, Allah, who is the just and the merciful, will handle it. Don't worry. But just focus on the moral of the story. So then he still felt bad. Subhanallah. If he felt that he might have a chance. And what about you and I? May Allah bless you all. So then he says, ala ahl al -ard. Tell me, the biggest scholar on earth. They said, we'll tell you. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. This time they took him to a scholar. Alhamdulillah. So they went, he went to the alim. Then he says, Sheikh, 
yeah, you alalim or whatever he called him. I killed how many? I killed 100 people, not 99 anymore. It's 100. Do you think there is room for me to start a new page? Can I be forgiven for what I've done? Wallahi, if you, subhanAllah. I know, I know this hadith and I'm sure many of you, many of you know this hadith. But I did not study the hadith in depth until this Ramadan. You know what he actually tells him? He doesn't actually say yes. He tells him, Wayhak. He's like, what are you talking about? In a positive sense. He says, why heck? Like, not just yes. Of course, there's room for you to be forgiven. Then he says, Man yahulu tawbah. And who in the world dares to block you from Allah's mercy? Who in the world dares to put a blockage from you to have a new page and start a new beginning? Of course, yes, naam. Subhanallah. Why heck? It's like someone, for example, saying, uh, let's say a young brother, um, he says, do you think, Brother Majid, do you think I have a chance to get married? I tell this brother, are you crazy? Of course, so many families would be honored to be يعني, related to you, subhanAllah, in-laws and so on. So when you say that, are you crazy? Of course, why haq wo to you? It's out of like, absolutely, Allah can forgive you. Then look what the alim says. Before I tell you what the alim says, realize something. The man who killed 100 people, he asked a yes or no question. It was a close-ended question. So yes, no, that's it. But the alim saw the sincerity or felt the genuineness of that man. So he did not just say yes or no. He detailed the answer. That's why if you ever go to our shuyukh and you ask him, Sheikh, is it halal or haram to do this? And they spend 10 minutes answering. Subhanallah. It's a halal or haram. No, but they want to tell you why. The wisdom behind it. What suits you better. Subhanallah. So then when he asked, yes or no, he said, yes, of course. And looked what he said. The alim said, you are, the one who killed 100 people, you are surrounded by very corrupted people. Your village is very wicked. No good. I advise you to let go of that city, to do hijrah, emigrate, leave it. Okay, where do I go? The alim gives them a substitution. What's a substitution? Go to the other city where it's a village of righteous people. And that's very important for us. You look at yourself, you do the accountability. I'm missing out here. I'm missing out there. I'm doing too much here. What do you do? Okay, how do you substitute things? How do you shift things around? So he says, go to the city of righteous people and wa'budillaha ma'ahum. And this also is a very nice touch, by the way. Worship Allah with them. SubhanAllah, sometimes we do very well when we are surrounded by righteous people. In our salah, we focus more sometimes, right? Um, we go on a relief trip together. Uh, we go to a halaqa together. SubhanAllah. It's a lot more impactful sometimes to have wonderful people like you guys now live watching it actually helps a lot, subhanAllah. Instead of you by yourself watching a recorded session, there's no other people all around. SubhanAllah, that's a human nature. So this man, as he was traveling, what happened? Allah sent the angel of death. SubhanAllah. What are the chances? You know where he dies? Where does he die? This is the village of the wicked, the village of the righteous. Where does he die? Here or here? The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, exactly in the middle. Allahu Akbar, right in the middle, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah. So a nice touch here as well from the story of the Prophet Sallallahu When he fell, I want you to imagine, ready? When he fell, like, may Allah protect us, you know, if someone ever fell unconscious before, may Allah protect you, Ya Rab. You might, as you fall, you try to, to fall in a way that you don't um, hit your head or something, right? You try your best with whatever consciousness you have left to avoid, like you fall on your hand or something, subhanAllah. So this man, as he was dying, look at this, ready? He moved with his chest a little bit, a little bit towards the righteous city. Subhanallah. Yani if that's what I can do a little bit more, I want to take a, at least an inch to a hand span closer to the righteous people. Subhanallah. To show Allah that I'm trying. Now, what happened? The angels of mercy and the angel of death, they came to that person. And that's not normal. Because usually one group is faced by the soul. May Allah make you and I of those who 
witness the angels of Rahmah, Amin Rabbil Alameen. So when the angels of mercy came, they argued with the angels of punishment. The angels of mercy said, this man came to repent, we will take him, i.e. to Jannah. The angels of punishment said, lam khayran qat. this man did not do any good in his life. No, no, we take him. So Allah sent an angel in the shape of a man, Adami, to judge between the two groups of angels as to who will take the soul of that man. And how was the judgment? We will measure the distance of the village he was living in to where he died. And from where he died to the village he was going to. Whatever he is closer to, he is taken by the appropriate group of angels. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the authentic narration, he told, he told the land of the righteous, Iqtaribi, come close. What do you mean? I don't get it. Allah literally told the geography, the topography of the earth to change and come closer. Allahu Akbar. When we are genuine, inshallah, Allah will change earth for you. All of us who took an elective as geology or science in high school and college, whatever you learned cannot be applied here. Allah shifted the village only to come closer to the man. Then Allah said and instructed the wicked city, Ibtaidi, move further away. So that land, Allah changed the geography as well. The landscape and it shifted a little bit further. Allahu Akbar. You see, when we are sincere, how Allah handles the situation. Things may seem impossible. You hold yourself accountable. Look, I don't think I will ever recover from this. I don't think I can ever do better there. Wallahi, you can, inshallah. Allah changed the earth for someone who killed a hundred people. What would Allah do to you? You are far from any sin of such sort, subhanAllah. Then they measured and he was closer to the people of the righteous. And he was taken. Do you know how close he was? There's a measurement, actually. We know the measurement. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Shibra, a hand span. This how close he was to the people of the righteous. Maybe that was the last move he did as he was falling to go with his chest to go closer to the righteous people. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you. May Allah elevate your status in dunya and akhirah. And please stay behind a bit because I have some good questions I received. But before that, inshallah, we'll pass on, on the mic to Sister Hafsa. She's about to tell you about something very important, very dear to all of us, a great program. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we really want to finish Ramadan strong, Allah has sent us an opportunity and I will leave it to Sister Hafsa to tell us the opportunity, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh Majid. A powerful reminder as always. I'm really looking forward to getting these some of these questions answered, inshallah, in just a second. Please do submit your questions privately so that we can collate them and do as many as we can before we end the session. But of course, alhamdulillah, we have one final major opportunity as a community to come together and to do something really, really great. And for that, I want to invite on um, one of our uh, beloved sheikhs, Sheikh Yusuf Bakir, coming in from HHRD, inshallah, to share some more about it, inshallah. And I'll be with you guys in the chat and for the Q&A. Welcome, Sheikh Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing very well, alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. And I'm honored to be here uh, seeing this beautiful man, Sheikh Majid. Allah bless you. Allah bless Sheikh. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Yusuf. We're going to give you your time, inshallah. We're looking forward to benefiting. May Allah accept. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who will be emancipated from hellfire in this blessed day and blessed night, Ya Rabbil Alameen. SubhanAllah, this is uh, our last odd night, the night of the 29th. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipe out all of our sins, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and emancipate our parents, our grandparents from hellfire, our children from hellfire, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Shower those who couldn't make it to this month with his mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bless their souls, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And give shifa to those who are going through a difficult time, those who are in the hospitals and weren't able to come and enjoy the ibadah with us. May Allah give them uh, full shifa, Ya Rabbil Alameen. 
So subhanAllah, about 12 years ago, I got the honor to visit the masjid of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, the students of Medina took us in a tour. So they showed us that grave of uh, our beloved Prophet Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They showed us the grave of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Omar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Then we went to al Sharifa, beautiful place. Once you walk into the al Sharifa, you, your heart will be at rest. You will find this tranquility that you will never experience somewhere else. And then, subhanAllah, the took us to Maqbarat al-Shuhada, those who got murdered in the battlefield of Uhud. So they showed us Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, the Maqbara of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then they showed us a Maqbara of a Sahabi who not all of us know about. His name is Abu Dahdah. So Abu Dahdah, his legacy was formed six months before the battle uh, of Uhud. So one time he was just sitting at the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu while an orphan boy approached the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this orphan boy had an issue with his neighbor. So he was telling the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I have a big problem with my neighbor. My parents passed down to me some animals and I'm struggling to keep those animals within my property because along my property, Ya Rasulullah, there is this little palm tree that belongs to my neighbor. So I've asked my neighbor to cut down this little palm tree so I can build my fence, so I can keep you know, my animals within my property. He refused. And I even offered them to, you know, to buy it from him. He also refused. So I'm here, Ya Rasulullah, please find a solution for me. So the Prophet Sallallahu called the neighbor to him. And the neighbor, when he walked into the masjid, he saw the orphan with the Prophet. He puts the two and two together and figured that the orphan boy is actually complaining to the Prophet about him. So he said, Rafatani ila Rasulillah, have you just raised a complaint about me to the Prophet? How dare you do this? The Prophet calmed him down. And then the Prophet asked him to actually, you know, cut down this little palm tree to his neighbor. He said, Ya Rasulullah, it's my hak, it's my palm tree, and I'm not going to get rid of it. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said, Tasaddaq biha idhan. Then just give it as a charity. The neighbor one more time looked at the Prophet and said, No, I'm not going to give it as a charity. I want it. It's my hak. It's, I have full ownership over it. I'm not going to let this palm tree go. Prophet Sallallahu gave him the last offer. He told him, give it as a charity and I promise you a palm tree in Jannah. The neighbor looked at the Prophet and said, Wala binakhlatin fil Jannah, ya Rasulullah. Not even a palm tree in Jannah, I'm not going to get rid of it. And he left. Who was there watching the entire predicament? Abu Dahdah. So Abu Dahdah walked into the neighbor's house and, and asked him, to actually buy this palm tree from him. He said, do you know who am I? He said, of course, you're Abu Dahdah, this man who has 200 palm trees in his farm. I know who you are. And then Abu Dahdah said, I want to buy from you this palm tree. He said, brother, I'm not going to get rid of this palm tree. Don't even try. He said, no, no, no. I have an offer that I don't think you will reject. Give me this little palm tree in an exchange of my entire farm. So the neighbor looked at him and said, like, are you insane? You want to give me your entire farm for this little palm tree? He said, yes, I'm serious. I have two witnesses. I'm ready to issue the contract. And Abu Dahdah was serious, and he actually had a contract, had, to, had a deal, an agreement with, with, with the neighbor. Now, Abu Dahdah is walking back to his old farm. And as he was closer to the farm, he yelled from the outside, Ya Ummad Dahdah, Ukhruji, Faqad Bi'atuha. O mother of Dahdah, get out, because I've sold my farm. Ummad Dahdah said, Liman Bi'atuha? Who, for who did you sell it? Abu Dahdah said, Bi'atuha lillahi wa li rasul. I have sold it to Allah and his messenger. 
ناو ام الدحداح سيد ربح البيع يا ابا الدحداح ولا successful transaction او ابا الدحداح ناو ابا الدحداح found his way back to the masjid of the prophet he came to the prophet and he was very passionate he gave him all his story and told him ya rasul allah do i now get this palm, get this palm tree that you promised the neighbor the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him كم من عطف رداه لأبا الدحداح؟ How many beautiful palm trees belong to you, O Abu Dhahdah, in Jannah? Six months later, Abu Dhahdah got murdered in the battlefield of Uhud. And as the Prophet وسلم, was searching for the dead bodies of his Sahaba, he asked the Sahaba, أين صاحبي? Where is my companion? Where is my friend? Remember, Abu Dhahdah was not that famous up among his community. So the Prophet ﷺ was asking about his companion. The Sahaba thought that he's talking about Hamza probably or Mus'ab. They told him, we got everybody. He said, no, 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 no. Aina sahib. Where is my companion? The, Abu Dahdah was an average man in the community. And as the old Arabs used to say, Rubba mashhurin fil ard, maghmurin fil sama, wa rubba maghmurin fil ard, mashhurin fil sama. And maybe somebody who is very famous, a motivational speaker, a celebrity, whatever. He's well known here in this earth, but he's absolutely unknown to Allah and his, and his, and his angels and the, and the heavens and the sky. Meaning his name is not remembered. His name is not mentioned. It's not that big of a deal. And maybe the opposite. Somebody who is just an average man or an average woman in this earth. But he's absolutely or she's absolutely known to Allah Azza wa May Allah make us among those who will be known to him, known to him Ya Rabbil Alameen. Now he said, Aina sahibi, where is my companion? Aina Abu Dahdah, where is Abu Dahdah? Bring me, bring me Abu Dahdah. Until they found his dead body and the Prophet وسلم, looked at the, the, the body of Abu Dahdah and said, Kam min radah. How many beautiful palm trees belong to you, Ya Abu Dahdah, in Jannah? SubhanAllah, if we think about this, there are many, many things we can really you know, unpack from the story of Abu Dahdah. But one thing that Abu Dahdah did is that he had that, that love and care to the, or to the orphan. He really wanted to relieve the burden off his shoulder. He wanted to make sure that this orphan has a good life with the inheritance that his parents has, have, have passed down to him. And he wanted the Jannah because the Prophet وسلم, said, Ana wa kahatan. I will be with the one who takes care of an orphan like this. We will be so close to uh, the one who uh, takes care of an orphan in Jannah. And what a goal towards the end of Ramadan to aim for that, inshallah ta'ala, to aim for the companion companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And SubhanAllah, as I was learning about the orphan uh, projects that Helping Hand has, Wallahi, Wallahi, it gave me goosebumps just thinking about how much of work that Helping Hand is doing to uh, our brothers and sisters who lost their parents. But unfortunately, um, there are right now, as we speak, about 367 orphans, Syrian uh, orphans, right now, and you know, as we are enjoying our Ramadan, they're actually um, struggling to find sponsorship. And we want to make sure today, inshallah, to help Helping Hand sponsoring those orphans that they're actually waiting for our service, waiting for our help. Alhamdulillah, Helping Hand is providing a full sponsorship to many orphans, we're talking about 28,000 orphans that Helping Hand is taking care of every single year. We're talking about uh, not only taking care of their food and their, their water, they're taking care of even their education, the Islamic education. What really gave me goosebumps today that I learned that there are about 80 hufal that they learned the Quran and they did khatim to, to the Quran in memorization and they got their ijazah from the, the programs that Helping Hand provided. So they're not only bringing food and bringing the basics and basic necessities. No, they want to raise orphans that they're actually strong with their, with their iman, with their faith. 
and also they're taken care of in terms of life necessities, inshallah ta'ala. So please, in this beautiful night of Ramadan and the day of Ramadan, in the last night of Ramadan, open your heart and open your bucket and give generously to Allah Azza wa Jal so we can have that opportunity, Ya Rabb, to be in the company of our Habib, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakumullah khairan. And please forgive me if I took uh, longer than, uh, than what was planned. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Jazakumallahu khair, Sheikh Yusuf. And actually exactly on the dot, subhanAllah, um, with, with your reminder, that was a beautiful reminder. I can see so many people have resonated with it here in the chat. And I ask you guys, as we've come together as a community so many times before, the link is hhrd dot org forward slash ramadan 360 so it's literally for the ramadan 360 community it's just us inshallah who are going to be facilitating this please inshallah support generously please share with others as well if you don't have the capacity right now or if you can't give the full amount to for one complete sponsorship let's make this part of our legacy as a community and as individuals and as muslimin uh inshallah we're going to be continuing with uh the q a but i want to make sure that you guys are supporting and as an encouragement to others if you are able to support in your capacity please just comment in the chat done whether it's on youtube or whether here it's on zoom uh, it'll be a motivation it'll be an encouragement for others this is not a time uh, that we want to hide that 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 motivation that that good deed inshallah uh going with that intention and with that i see sheikh majid is still with us so inshallah we're going to do our q a portion and please, of course, continue to keep the aid workers, keep the keep the folks that in, in HHRD and you're the eyes. It's very difficult work to facilitate this. And subhanAllah, it's such an honor that not only do they take care of their, their physical needs, but they take care of their social needs. They take care, they celebrate Eid with them. They give them that feeling of normalcy that these children don't have the opportunity for from birth to really have that experience, subhanAllah. So Jazakumullah khair, everyone, for your support. And Sheikh, I'm going to bring you back, uh, Sheikh Majid, inshallah, for our Q&A. Uh, portion of today's session. So Sheikh, some amazing questions were submitted. Uh, we'll do our best to, to go through as many of them as we possibly can before we have to close uh, and move on to our Quran Reflect. Are you ready, Bismillah? Bismillah. All righty, Sheikh. So the first question um, is, what if we do really great in a new good deed, for example, charity, this Ramadan, and it's new for us, but at the same time, we deteriorate in other forms of worship. Is this making progress or not? And if no, if so, how do we overcome it? Oh, fantastic. Uh, before I answer this question, if it's okay, I want to talk a l just very, very briefly, inshallah, about the orphan sponsorship program. Um, I'm not sure, Hafsa, if you can pin the link or not. It's a very straightforward. Just You can just click the link, okay? And then on that same page, if you scroll down, and this is what I like. I, I'm sure many of you are in the same boat as, my, as mine, Yanni. Yeah. We're all in the same situation that we like to see where our money goes. So if you actually click on that link, you will see something that may not be common, which is what, which is the actual people, a picture, their birth date, how old they are. Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much, Hafsa. Right? If you actually go up a little bit, Sister Hafsa, go all the way up. Okay, all the way up. And is, uh, okay, click on sponsor an orphan. Hopefully that's the same link I have here. Okay, now we'll just scroll down. Look how beautiful this is. Beautiful and sad. So now, you know, uh, Hisham Muhammad, 10 years old, grade one, Tanzania, and you'll get updates. And that's, and why am I sharing this? Because I was, we we're very blessed, as Brother Abdurrahman would just mention right now. And then uh, Sister Hafsa, can you click girls, please? There's girls, you see boys, girls, right? And then SubhanAllah, people work with things differently. I, I personally have four girls. So one of maybe the ways to thank Allah for the four daughters that I have is go sponsor me an orphan who's a girl around the same date of birth as my daughter. Maybe that's a way to thank Allah for what he gave me, right? And then you can also choose country. So if you see all countries you want, I, this is normal. You're not a racist, okay? If you prefer Philippines over Kenya, it's okay, inshallah. Or you prefer Somalia over Jordan, it's fine. Sometimes, subhanAllah, Obviously, we're assuming the best of everyone. So this is something to strengthen your situation. But I'll end with this, inshallah. And I'm sure you guys will agree with me. The cool thing about it, before I say that, sister, if you press, click sponsor. And like, no, if you go down, go down, go down. No, yeah, choose any sister, any sister. Yes, sponsor. You get three options, right? Am I right or wrong? If you scroll down a bit. Yes, click sponsor. You have, now select the duration. 
you want one time, what just one year, you want to sponsor for one year. Now the people ask a question, do I have to sponsor my whole life to be able to be the prophet's neighbor? No, just sponsor for a year. Inshallah, you'll be encompassed in that. Uh, some people cannot do one year payment, do 12 months. Uh, some people say, you know what? I want to do it until that girl becomes mature. Allahu Akbar. Some people actually sponsor people that, until they're 18 or until they get married. Subhanallah. So you see, so everything is customized. But it's not realistic for me. I'll start with myself, for me. And anyone in the West, anyone that is capable to put in a small amount, inshallah, and not end up doing it. Correct? So we are tested with blessings. They are tested with hardship. Their job is to be patient. Our job is to be grateful. So I just want, I, I really, really hope, I know I took time from the Q&A, but I think this was very critical for me to share. End Ramadan strong. Get you an orphan or two or whatever your case is. May Allah accept from all of us. Amir Rabbil Alim. Okay, so the question, someone does an act of worship and as they do it, they drop something else. Now, this is known as opportunity cost sometimes, right? If you, <coughs> what happens? If you, for example, would to um, pray taraweeh in the masjid, um, with that amount of time, you would have read more Quran at home, as an example. Or someone says, now that I'm married, I'm never doing in Ramadan what I used to do when I was single. This, subhanAllah, I reflect on this just last night. Just last night, I was reflecting on my Ramadan when I was like a college student and now married with four children and, you know, having a job, teaching, all that stuff. Like two different worlds. Now, what's our mistake sometimes? We think our iman dropped. We think, you know, we're doing pretty bad. No, it's also an act of worship to shift things. I remember I was able to sleep at 1 a.m., wake up at 3 a.m., energized, going to Qiyam with my Dodge Neon and fully refreshed. Now it is almost impossible for me to do that. Why? Well, a part of it, we have uh, the children. Part of it, we have uh, this trip and that flight. But so subhanAllah, just something to keep in mind, things are changing, not necessarily that you're dro the dropping as well. And then you see like a curve. So when, when you were, uh, let's say, single, you're a college student, you had a lot of time, you did so much, right, in the masjid and these type of ibadat. Now you get married, you have children, a lot of responsibility. So now you're not doing, quote unquote, as good as before. Now what happens, inshallah, as you get older, right? That's when you see now, mashallah, tabarakallah, our uncles in the masjid, right? Like, you're like, brother, do you rent the first row in the masjid? They're always there, right? They read Quran, they do three khatmas. Like, how do you even do that? Because now has the life, the kids are now older, the grandchildren, you know, living the life, right, of ibadah and so on. So just keep that in mind, inshallah, throughout your life. That is also ibadah. And maybe I'll clarify, inshallah, with Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, a great alim and scholar. He was saying in his halaqa, last night I walked into my house and I saw my mother laying on the couch or lying on the couch. So I massaged her feet. He's telling his students. Then at that moment, I noticed my brother in his room praying Qiyam layl the night prayers. And he said, when Yom Al-Qiyamah comes, if I were to be given the option to get the reward of the Qiyam or the reward of massaging my mother's feet, I will not accept the Qiyam over massaging my mother's feet. SubhanAllah. <clears throat> so that's the ilm, the knowledge aspect. May Allah grant us the best. So today is the day of massaging, inshallah. <laughs> May Allah bless you. Uh, okay. Yeah. The next question that I have is, um, when you have repented and stay away from a sin and encourage others to stay away from it, how do you help ease your heart if thoughts of despair still affect you from time to time? How can one increase husnudan in Allah? Okay, so thinking bad of oneself is actually really good. Uh, we were taught, think bad of yourself but think good of others. So when I commit a sin and we all do, may Allah forgive us, every now and then it does kick in in our memory. You did this back in the day, like subhanAllah, what if people today know that ah, I did this, subhanAllah, it's very uh, painful. <clears throat> Where is it a problem when the level of despair pushes the person away? When the level of hope, uh, people are feeling hopeless, that they no longer do the deed. So that's why I mentioned in the story, the guy who killed 99 people, he did not give up on Allah. He did not despair. Then what about you and I? So yes, be fearful, but within reason. 
And what's within reason is the type of fear that pushes you closer to Allah and not the type of fear that pushes you away from Allah. You try to strike that balance as much as you possibly can. And may Allah grant us the best. I mean, um, the next thing, is, the next question is during the last days of Ramadan, it's common to feel anxious and overwhelmed. Sometimes it feels like we can never do enough. What should we do in such situations? Um, actually, that is true. We can never do enough. And that's a great feeling. The person who asked the question is feeling. If the angels, there's a certain group of angels, <clears throat> the moment Allah created them, imagine Allah created them, they're sajda, they're in prostration. These angels, as I'm speaking now, they're prostrating. At the time of Adam, they're prostrating. At the time of the last human being, they're prostrating. When the day of judgment happens, they get up. So all of these millenniums, not even centuries, Allah all these millenniums, they were prostrating. When Allah caused Yom Al-Qiyamah to start, what did these angels say? Subhanaka ma abadanaka haqqa ibadatik. Praise be to Allah. We have not worshipped you enough. Subhanallah. So having that feeling is good. We don't want to ever reach a point where like, you know what, Allah, I did pretty well. Like, uh, I, I hope you're pleased with me in the sense like, you know, we're showing off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never worship Allah enough. That's why, subhanAllah, there was a, a brother. This was on, when was it? Wednesday? No, Friday. Friday? Yeah, Friday. I went to a brother, an older brother, and then he asked me a question. I was doing my taxes, right? So he asked me a question at the end. I was going to charge him, but no problem. So he said, uh, brother, um, I don't think since I was born till this day, and he's, mashallah, approaching 70 years old. Uh, he's like, I don't think throughout my entire life, I did enough good deeds to qualify me to Jannah. And that's a guy who was approaching 70 years old. So he said, I, I, like he's feeling a little bit hopeless. Like all what I did, I don't think that's enough. I think Allah deserves more. So I told him, you are right. No one will ever do enough good deeds to qualify him for Jannah. So I told him something to shake him a little bit more. Then I told him, not even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has enough deeds by itself to qualify to Jannah. He said, are you serious? I said, yes, authentic hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no one goes to Jannah due to their deeds. So they said, not even you, ya Rasulullah. He said, not even me. Allahu Akbar. Illa an yataghammadani Allahu bi fadlin minhu wa rahma. Unless Allah showers me with his mercy. So we make it to Jannah due to Allah's mercy. When I say this in my class, I teach a class called Parish Nations. I talk about that point. And I'm, Brother Bilal was in Calgary. So I said, do, so we go to Allah, uh, to Jannah due to uh, Allah's mercy or due to our deeds. When I ask this question in the class, what do you think the class says? Due to our deeds or due to Allah's mercy? Due to Allah's mercy. So when they say that, you know what I do? I take off the mic. I actually take off the mic, I pack my laptop, and I say, since we go to Allah due to our mercy, Jazakumullah khairan, there's no point in me being in Calgary or being in Michigan or giving a lecture or traveling. Since all of that is meaningless, it's only Allah's mercy that takes us. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. SubhanAllah. And then he's like, no, no, no. Uh, why no, no, no? SubhanAllah. Your good deeds are the prerequisite to Allah's mercy. Keep that in mind. Your good deeds are the prerequisite for Allah's mercy. Just like how for Musa السلام, to split the ocean to two large mountains, two bodies of water, he had to, with the stick, hit the water. He hits the water, Allah splits it into two mountains. If he doesn't split the water with the stick, the mountains will not exist. So keep that in mind, inshallah, to be able to balance things. Just go to Allah, hoping Allah's mercy. And when you feel you've not done enough, that's great. Now you go to Allah. Ya Allah, I beg you to shower me with your mercy. Right? And you ask for Allah's rahmah. You ask for Allah's aid and help and assistance. And may Allah bless us all. Amin Rabbil Alameen.
Um, I just looked at the clock and had a heart attack. So uh, I do want to, inshallah, close off. I know there's some beautiful questions that were still submitted, but alhamdulillah, we benefited so much in this session with you already. And Jazakumullah khair for that reminder. I think humanizing the experience and, and seeing the faces and seeing, and, and almost like you can almost fill in the story as you're seeing, uh, you know, subhanAllah orphans that, that need sponsorship. And there's so many hundreds from each country uh, that really helped us in that experience. Jazakumullah khair. I hope that inspired somebody who was listening or watching to share it with somebody else to take on, you know, you know, an orphan sponsorship themselves as well. Uh, inshallah ta'ala may Allah accept from us all. I mean, Sheikh, it's a pleasure to have you back for Ramadan 360. We look forward to seeing you on our screens and inshallah in person very soon. For now, take care. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum khair all. Assalamu alaikum. That was Sheikh Majid Mahmoud, one of our Amagrib instructors. You've heard a lot about him. You've seen him and benefited now, alhamdulillah. Please keep Sheikh and his family and his daughters in your du'as. Uh, and inshallah, we're going to do, we're going to get an opportunity to start our Quran Reflect session with Ustad Taymiya Zubair. Ustad Taymiya, I have a good day and then I have a bad day for you. <laughs> so please forgive me, alhamdulillah. I feel like we, we hopefully bounced it out a little bit uh, with yesterday's session. Looking forward to inshallah reflecting on today's topic. And I know a lot of people have some important thoughts to share. I just want to take a second. Subhanallah, just to quickly point out, once again, the, the link for hhrd.org forward slash Ramadan 360. Please make sure that you are supporting. I know you've been asked and asked and you've given and you've given. These are one of the final opportunities that we have to maximize on our deeds. And subhanAllah, I can't help but reflect on the fact that there are children who are born into this world who have not known a single day of peace and freedom and ease and who have who've started life on hard. You know, who've started with without a father or without both parents soon into their early childhood and who don't have the, the comforts or the support, the psychological, you know, support, which honestly, subhanAllah, is almost a luxury sometimes. Uh, without that, life is so much more difficult. All those milestones, all those, you know, they're dependent on us to be able to, to help them through that. And one of the most beautiful things I really love about HHRD that Sheikh Majid also pointed out, that, that uh, Sheikh Yusuf pointed out earlier, is that they give them more than just food. They give them a bit of a community. They give them education. They had, uh, it was 80 hafad that have come out of the experience, subhanAllah. They give them health support. They give them social activities. And they give them protection as well, subhanAllah. Making sure that there's people visiting them at home or at school to ensure that they're safe and they're they're provided for and they can intervene if there's any issues subhanallah those that's such essential work and such a holistic way to, to support orphans so please make sure that you do support them in their efforts again hhrd.org forward slash ramadan 360 is the link um and yes you are allowed to share the link anywhere else we want to we want to maximize the impact as much as we can and and share and multiply all of our ajr for that with that let's jump in assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi uh, how are you doing today Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, I'm well. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah, barakallah. Let's begin. As salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, everyone. A'udhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim. Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulih al kareem. So, the concept of muhasabatu nafs, self accountability, is a very, very important concept for the, for the believer. Um, why? Because when we believe in Allah, and we believe in the day of judgment. We know that the day of judgment is Yawmul Hisab. It is the day of account, which cannot be avoided. There is no avoiding Yawmul Hisab. Because Wabil Akhirati Hum they believe in the hereafter with conviction. You, when you believe that yes, the day of judgment is real, then you know that the day of judgment is the day of account. And this is a promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us that thumma inna alayna hisabahum, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold people accountable. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sari'ul hisab. He is swift in bringing people to account. Meaning it may seem like the day of judgment is far, but the time when we are going to be held accountable is not that far at all. And hisab is to count, to calculate, to number. And basically, yawmul hisab is the day when our deeds will be counted, they will be weighed, they will be assigned a reward or a punishment. And it's not just, you know, some deeds that will be counted. In Surah Al-Kahf, ayah number 49, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that الْكِتَابُ فَتَرَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ That when the book will be displayed, meaning when people will be given their books, their records, the criminals will be 
terrified of what is in their records. And they will say, يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا They will say, what is with this book that it doesn't leave anything small or big except that it has enumerated it? They will not complain that what is written in our record is not true. No, their complaint will not be that this is unfair. No, their complaint will be that this record has everything in it, right? And in the Quran, we learn that whoever does even an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. And our records will be opened and we will be told, read your record yourself. You yourself are, you know, are able to see, are able to reckon uh, what you deserve based on what you see in your record. And we are told in the Quran in Surah Al-Inshiqaq that some people will be given their records in their right hands, right? And some people will be given their records in their left hands. In, in Surah Al-Haqqa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِ the one who is given his record in his right hand will say, here, read my book. Meaning, meaning read my record. Like, like imagine a person who has passed an exam and they get their test paper back and they're like, yes. They, they go around showing it to everybody. And they will, and this person will say, Inni I knew, I was sure that I was going to meet my account. Meaning I knew that I would see the result of my deeds after being held accountable. So there's a difference between people who prepare for that account and people who neglect that account. So since there's no avoiding it, there's no getting, you know, that there's no running away from being held accountable on the day of judgment, what should we do? We must hold ourselves accountable today. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hashr, verse 18, that, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, O you who have believed, ittaqullaha, fear Allah, wal tanzur nafsun ma qaddamat lighad. Each person should see what they are sending ahead for tomorrow. What kind of deeds are they sending ahead for tomorrow? Tomorrow doesn't just mean five years from now in this world, or uh, you, you know, when we think about tomorrow, we think about, okay, do I have food for tomorrow? Do I have money for tomorrow? Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to consider what we are sending ahead for the day of judgment, for what is to come after this life. وَاتَّقُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And fear Allah, indeed Allah is fully aware of what you are doing. Umar bin Khattab anhu said that the account on the day of judgment will be easy on the one who holds himself accountable in the world. Why? Because the one who holds himself accountable in the world, then what happens? They are able to recognize their faults. They're able to recognize where they're falling short. They're able to learn from their mistakes and you know, improve themselves and increase you know, in their in their good deeds. And the funny thing is that we are, uh, you know, sometimes we, we hold other people accountable, but we fail to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, Maimoun ibn Mehran said that the slave of Allah cannot be considered a taqi, a righteous person. They cannot any, become a righteous person until they hold themselves accountable just as they hold their business partner accountable for where, you know, the other person got his food and clothing from. Like imagine if you're working with someone, right? You are going to be constantly watching them. Okay, where where did he get this new car from, right? He has a new phone, like our, our you know, the, the profits that we're making, the money that we're making together cannot explain that all of a sudden he has a brand new car. Where is this coming from? Right. So we are 
uh, very observant of other people's actions, right? We we keep an eye on, on other people, especially if we have people under our care, like our children, right? Then we we monitor them a lot, but we fail to monitor ourselves. So the one who holds himself accountable, what happens to them? They're able to recognize their own faults. We learned that Umar radiallahu anhu, he once saw Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu pulling on his tongue. And Umar radiallahu anhu asked him that, O oh, Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, what are you doing? So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu replied that this tongue holds me towards destruction. Okay, I end up saying things that lead me to my own destruction. And the Prophet ﷺ said that every limb of the body complains to Allah of the sharpness of the tongue. Subhanallah. This is Abu Bakr anhu, someone who was so soft-hearted, someone who would cry so much. But he knew, he was aware of the slips of his tongue. How is that possible that you become aware of where you fall short, where you make mistakes, where you slip, when you hold yourself accountable? So how do you hold yourself accountable? Well, you, you keep checking your intentions. You keep asking yourself that, who am I doing this for? Am I doing this for Allah? Am I doing this to seek praise from people? Am I doing this for dunya? Am I doing this for akhirah? You keep checking your intentions. And when you complete something, you check the manner, you, you examine the manner in which you did it. Like, for example, when you complete your fast, think, consider for a moment, how exactly was the quality of your fast, right? Also, when you do something, examine uh, how frequently you do it. Like, for example, if you say that, yes, I recited the Quran, well, how much did you recite? Just a page and a half? Or you were capable of reciting more and you didn't do more. So examine your intentions and also examine your good deeds. And also examine your mistakes. Not to condemn yourself or to put yourself down, but to learn from them, to improve. Because you cannot fix something unless you are able to label it. Unless you are able to identify it. Right? Self-awareness is the first step, first step towards improvement. If you are not aware, for example, of the fact that you're getting stressed out in certain situations, you're getting very, uh, you know, anxious in certain situations, then you will not be able to manage that anxiety, right? So the first step towards improvement is self-awareness. So this is why it's important that you sit with your mistakes and you, you recognize that, yes, I messed up over here. I yelled at my children. I was disrespectful to my husband. I was disrespectful to my mother. I should not have, you know, uh, said this to my father, right? This is important. Not to say to yourself that I'm such a bad person. I'm, I'm such a bad Muslim. I'm such a bad daughter. No, but to improve from, you, for, you know, from your uh, yani, to improve your condition. And the thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put something inside of ourselves which, which criticizes us when we do something wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, verse number two, la uqsimu bin nafs lawama. And no, I swear by the nafs that is lawama, that constantly criticizes. And Imam al-Shawkani records in, in the tafsir of this ayat that Mujahid said that this is the one who criticizes himself over the good that he misses out on. And he, uh, this is the person who, when, when, when they miss doing something good, they don't just say, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. No. They say, why? Why, why didn't I do it? And this is the person who criticizes himself for when he does something wrong, that why did you do it? You should not have done it. Now, when you realize that you've missed out on doing something good or that you have done something bad, what's the next step? What's the next step? The next step is seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's the first thing that we have to do. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, like we learned earlier, there is no amount of good deeds that you can do 
that will qualify you for paradise, right? So you could be constantly blaming yourself for missing out on, you know, doing more good. But that that's not going to help. What is necessary is that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. In a hadith, we learn that Tuba liman wajada fi sahifatihi istighfarun kathir. Good news for the one who will find a lot of istighfar in their record, in their record of good deeds, right? Uh, or in their record of deeds that they find a lot of istighfar on the day of judgment. So make sure that the moment you realize that you missed out on something good or that you sh you you did something wrong, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, uh, another thing is uh, that replace the bad deed with, with, with a good deed, right? As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, that وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا Follow up the bad deed with a good deed and the good deed is going to erase it. Now, muhasabat uh, nafs is only possible when we focus more on our own mistakes instead of the mistakes of other people. Yes, the people around us are human, just like we are. But we cannot change other people. The only person whom we can change is who? Ourselves. It is only our own words, our own actions that we can change. So focus on that. And one last thing I want to mention is that when you're dealing with other people, be easy with them. Be easy on others so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is easy with you in holding you accountable. There's a hadith in which we learn the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the condition of a man who, uh, who basically did not do a lot of good in his lifetime. And the only good thing he had done was that he was easy with people in his business dealings. And he especially ordered his servants that be easy with people who are in difficulty. Meaning when someone needs to make a payment, and they're struggling financially, they're not able to make a payment, give them more time. Give them a discount. Be easy on them. So when this man was held accountable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِذَلِكَ مِنْهُ فَتَجَاوُ Sorry, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِذَلِكَ مِنْهُ تَجَاوَزُ عَنْهُ That we are more entitled to do that than he is. So forgive him. Meaning, remove all of his sins he used to be easy with people. I will be even more easy with this person. So when you are dealing with people, don't you know be uh, pinpointing every little mistake and fault of theirs and being very difficult with them. No, be easygoing, be gentle, be forgiving in hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also be easy with you when holding you to account, inshallah. All right, let's hear from you. Uh, reflections. Bismillah. Somebody has written, change oneself, change the ummah. MashaAllah. Very good. Um, seek instant repentance and forgiveness. Very good. All right, Aziza, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So, listening to you today, um, has me a little bit emotional because, you know, in growing up as a teenager, I had a lot of anger. I was filled with a lot of anger due to, you know, certain things happening with my childhood. And as I became an adult, that anger went with me because I always felt the need that I had to either justify or fight, you know, for, for me to survive. But as I went along, and began allowing Allah to take charge and giving myself a chance, going to therapy, etc. I realized that the more I let that anger go, the more I forgave, not necessarily go back with the people who hurt me, but the more I forgave and just let it go and let Allah take control, I became more at peace. Mm -hmm. I felt calm and my interaction with people generally, it changed. 
because no longer did I take what someone said to me as being personal and mm -hmm. felt the need that I had to stand and defend and justify and, you know, be upset about it. I was no longer like that. Mm -hmm. And as time went along, my interaction with my family, my friends, my coworkers, um, even my own daughter now. I mean, I've been a single parent for, what, 13 years. And dealing with her as a child, we had a lot to go through. But alhamdulillah, today, the relationship I have with her and the relationship I have with, you know, my own family members, my siblings, everyone. Mm -hmm. And it is so calm. It is so peaceful. And mm -hmm. I realize that, yes, I do have to take account and I have to look at myself and I had to fix the things that needed to be fixed mm -hmm. and allow Allah to take control and help me as well, too. So listening to you today and even through the whole Al Maghrib um, series, there were so many things throughout this entire thing that had me very, very emotional. But Alhamdulillah, they were great reminders. And I thoroughly enjoyed this. And, you know, part of me wished that Ramadan would continue. But we know it has to come to an end. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, your reflection made me um, think that, you know, it, 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 it made me realize that um, self accountability is not about being self critical just to blame yourself. Okay. It is taking a step to improve yourself. Like, for example, when you look into the mirror, why why do you do that? Do you do that to hate on yourself? No. You do that to see, okay, does anything need fixing over here, right? I mean, should I be applying a different kind of a serum? Should I be, you know, doing something? You know, like you you look at yourself in the mirror, you stand on the scale, right? You When you get dressed, you look at your clothes in the mirror. Why? Because you want to adjust anything that is not okay, right? When you go, for example, to a nutritionist and you, you know, you find out how, you, how you're supposed to eat better. Again, that is to improve your health. So self-accountability is for the purpose of improving yourself, not to put yourself down. It is actually the first step towards improving, lift, you know, uplifting yourself, inshallah. Raghat, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Jazakum for all these sessions and for your consistency and everything. Um, one thing I like to do is just, like you said, like before I go to bed, just think about everything. Think about the day. Think about everything going on. And like maybe, okay, maybe my worship hasn't been its best or maybe other things haven't been its best. But like, there, you know, some things that I can control is maybe um, at least I can forgive people. At least I can... Um, you know, just clean my heart and clean my my feelings and clean everything like that. You know, that's something that maybe for me, I find easier to do. So, and it just, uh, maybe it's less effort for me. So whatever I find that's less effort for me, that at least I can do that, that, um, you know, I want to have my heart to be clean. And just like, you know, when I, every time I hear about that story of the Sahabi, they said, this person is of Jannah, this person is of Jannah. And he's like, follows him and goes home with him. He's like, he's not doing any extra prayer. He's not doing any extra fast. What is this guy doing? He's like, I just, I forgive everybody. It's as simple as that. My heart is clear. My heart is clear. And so, I, you know, I, I just love that story. And it's just like, it's something that I feel like we can emulate if we try. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, may Allah accept from all of us. Jazakallah khairan for sharing that. Uh, it reminds me of how... Uh, it is a sunnah to recite the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah before going to sleep. And in that, you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِن نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا That, O oh, our Lord, do not hold us to account if we if we forget something or if we make a mistake. Right? That if I was supposed to do something and I forgot or I made a mistake, Ya Rabb, you you forgive me. You don't hold me accountable for that, right? And then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَعْفُ عَنَّا وَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا Oh Allah, pardon us, forgive us, have mercy on us. So 
in that we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And, and this is a very healthy practice, actually, that you end every day of yours by turning to Allah, asking him for forgiveness, because you realize that, yes, I, I have made many mistakes and I'm not where I should be and I need help to improve. And it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can provide that help to me. So the you know there's no running away from Allah. There's only running to Allah. And this is the whole purpose of muhasabatun nafs, of self-accountability. That you look at where the gaps are, where the faults are, and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pardon, to forgive with his mercy, inshallah. All right, alhamdulillah, hafsa. Jazakumullah khair, Ustada, for the beautiful session today. And to all of you, subhanAllah, what makes these sessions impactful and, and extra special is because you guys come on here and you guys make yourself vulnerable and connect and share. And, and subhanAllah, those of you who are sharing in the chat, who are able to and who are coming on, on screen, may Allah reward you and make it heavy on your skills. It's beautiful to have you as all part of this community, alhamdulillah. Uh, with that said, that is our 28th session. Jazakumullah khair, Ustada Taymiya. Inshallah, a couple more sessions. We'll see if we can make up some of that time again. Inshallah, we look forward no worries, to it. Inshallah. I think I'm more stressed about no this than you it's are, Ustada. Good. You're chill. Yeah, it's, You're like, it's good. I, I enjoyed, and especially today's presentation about the orphan sponsorship was wonderful. Alhamdulillah. It's excellent. Especially, you know, there's only one odd night left now. So it's an excellent time to do something yourself and also to share this with other people to give them the opportunity as well. Absolutely. Jazakumullah khair Ustada for that reminder. We'll see you inshallah tomorrow for our 29th session. Uh, we look forward to that inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And that was 29th session on self-accountability. Just a quick reminder, Ustada said it well as well. You know, you heard that reminder, and I know many of you are waiting until the sun sets, especially those who are in the Eastern Hemisphere. If you guys are already, mashallah, in the 29th night, may Allah accept from you. But please do. The link is hhrd.org forward slash Ramadan 360. And I know the brother, uh, you know, sorry, uh, the Sheikh said that there is, I think, 357 Syrian orphans. Let's try to get through as many, if not all of them, inshallah, as a community. Um, I do, Honestly, it, it it's so humbling to hear, especially I know we've seen the, the images of children in Gaza that, you know, that who are losing family, who are losing themselves, who are losing so much back to back. And we wish we could do something. This is something where we can actually do something. And th there are orphans waiting for our support. So where we have the ability, instead of, you know, hoping and just praying, let's take action, inshallah. And I know we are people of action, mashallah. We, are, we encourage each other to do good and we do it together. So please do continue to support and to, and, and especially for this cause that we've just introduced to you today, hhrd.org forward slash Ramadan 360. Please do support. I have a quick message from them. It's a very little wholesome video. So I hope that you guys can watch inshallah before we close off for today's session. Imagine a world where every child is given a chance at life to reach their full potential. A world where love and support are never in short supply. That's the world you can help create for an orphan child. Your donation can provide food, education, social upliftment, and health care. But most importantly, it can give hope. You can make a difference by sponsoring an orphan with Helping Hand USA. Please donate today. Dear donor, my name is Layla. I'm seven years old and I live in Afghanistan. As one of Helping Hands sponsored orphans, I want to say thank you for your kindness and generosity. Your kindness makes us really happy and hopeful. Because of you, we receive food, health care, and education support. You make us feel loved, and that's the best feeling in the world. We get to connect with amazing people from Helping Hand USA. They do so much for us. They teach us good manners and allow us to make friends and be part of society. They take us on field trips, attend iftar dinners and eye parties, and so much more. All that because of you. When I grow up, I want to be like you. I want to help kids around the world. Thank you for changing my life and giving me hope. Because of your support, my dreams can come true. There you are. What a wholesome message that is. I don't know about you guys, but that is something I want to be a part of. I want to have a, a portion of that. So please do support, inshallah. We'll see you guys tomorrow. 
uh, for our 29th session. You're going to have Brother Abdurrahman Wood back to rock the stage, inshallah, to host you for tomorrow's session. But I'll see you guys for the final day. Uh, please, of course, keep the people of Palestine, keep the people around the Ummah who need your help and your support and your da'as and do as much as you can to take care of them. Kahoot, inshallah, is going to be tomorrow. Uh, is going to be on Tuesday, inshallah. So look out for that. For now, take care. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. Make thought that the people of Palestine and those around the world are happy and healthy and safe. And assalamu alaikum wa